Hi, I'm Susan. Welcome to my new chess improvement video series. This is volume six and the topic of this volume are tactics. I think that by far the most fun part of chess is learning about tactics, understanding them, and then playing them in your own game and winning with them, winning material or checkmating your opponent. So it's, I think, really, really essential part of the game. And generally I recommend to all beginner intermediate chess players to solve chess tactics puzzles daily or as many as often as they can to improve their game. I believe that most games on an amateur level get decided because of tactics, whether who makes the last mistakes and if you take advantage of it or not. So it's really, really important. I bet you're already familiar with the most basic four chess tactics, the forks, the pins, the skewers, and the discoveries. We'll see some of those in this volume as well, but I'll try to focus also on others, such as the intermediate move, which is, I think, probably one of the most important of the least taught patterns of chess tactics. We'll look a little bit at stalemate, zugzwang, different ideas, tactical ideas that you may save a game with or win material or win the game with. How should you study and practice your improve your tactical skills? Well, you should solve, as I said, as many as you can. And especially I recommend to solve endgame studies. Why? Because often they are of the purest form with limited number of pieces and the, the ideas are brilliantly coming out, as you will see in the upcoming examples. Enjoy now the upcoming tactics from end games to middle games, some from practical games, some composed, but the brilliancy will be all there. Enjoy. So let's get started to learn about some of the most important tactics in chess. The most common ones are the fork, the pin, the skewer, and the discovery. So let's start first in this chapter with the forks. We'll start out with some amazing endgame puzzles that work because exactly of the fork. The fork is also known as double attack. So let's see how to solve this puzzle. What my suggestion would be that before I show the solution to each of these positions, you try to pause for a few minutes until you try to figure out on your own how to force your opponent into a fork and win material and the game. So in this position, it is right to move. The question is what to do. The goal is to win the black queen. You don't mind losing your rook if you have to, as long as you will win the black queen. Okay, so it's pretty forceful, which means that you have to start with one of the checks. However, only one of those checks work. So, what would happen if the rook would check on a7? It almost seems to work. Now, this is the important part. It's not enough to just see one move of the opponent, like in b5, and then everything works great, you made a fork. But you always need to look for, also, for the opponent's best move. And in this case, if the king runs the other way, then there is no fork, and black will maintain his advantage. So let's go back to the beginning, and therefore, the correct check is rook to b4. Now black has only one move, king a5. And now it appears that white pretty much ran out of checks even, or if he gives a check, that will be captured right away. Nevertheless, it works. Rook b5, an impressive move. The rook can be captured by both the king or the queen. Moreover, the king can also step out of the check. Well, that's the simple one. If the king captures, we just fork. If the king moves to a4, even worse, white even checkmate. 
if the king goes to a6, yet another 4. But what happens if queen takes? Now we are even lost our rook. And amazingly, white still wins. Yet another check. Now, if the king goes down to a6, 4 through c7, king goes to a4, 4 on c3. However, it's also important to calculate precisely what happens if black takes the pawn and sacrifices the queen. Now, you just take the queen, king takes, and now you need to calculate who comes first. Black is up a pawn at the moment, but of course the white king is closer to all those pawns on the king's side, and that's what decides the fate of this position. Black king also needs to run, trying to get white's last pawn. They are both running, running, and it seems that black is doing just fine, protected his own pawn, and moreover is attacking white. But the problem is, after king h6, Black is in Zugzwang, which means he needs to move. He wishes he doesn't need to move. He could say, I pass, I don't want to move. But you cannot do such a thing in chess. The problem is, once the king moves, the pawn on g6 will be lost, and so will the game. Let's go on and see a next example. Similar situation, as you can see. White has a rook and a knight. For the queen. Normally such a material balance would be more or less equal. White also has an extra couple pawns. However, just as in the previous example, white can force the black king and queen into a fork. This is perhaps even trickier than our last example. So again, as I mentioned, please pause for a moment and when you think you've got it, then go ahead and See what I have to say. Okay, so it seems like the black queen is quite far away from the king and by no means are they in a forking position, right? If the black queen would be on a5, then, then it would be a forking situation, not now. So we need to force them so the knight can fork later. Checking with the pawn with d4 wouldn't work because the black king would run away to f4 and then it's too late trying to force them into the fork. The correct move is, on the other hand, sacrificing a pawn with f4. Well, this could be captured by either the king or queen, or the king can move to various places. Let's start with the obvious, why not going back there, then it's checkmate. Let's see next what happens if the king moves to e4. Again, no immediate fork. However, white can make actually a quiet move. Knight e6, threatening the checkmate with the pawn with d3. And the only way trying to stop that uh, would be capturing the rook. But then, here we go, fork. After f4, Black can take the pawn though. Let's first see what happens if the king takes. Then it's a pretty simple decoy combination. Rook check, basically forking the king and queen. And once queen takes, knight e6, then knight captures the queen and will be left with an easily won pawn endgame, white having two extra pawns. And now comes the most challenging part. What happens if the black queen captures on f4. This is really, really impressive. The next move is rook d4. Look at that. Putting the rook in double attack. Also, the black queen seemingly has a lot of different places to go to. And yet, regardless where the queen goes, it will either step into a fork or checkmate. You can look at each one of them, but just for example, if the queen goes to h6, knight f7, forks. Or if the king takes the rook, the fork comes in this shape. If the queen goes to f6, even worse, 
knight c6, checkmate. So, what happens after queen f8? Well, now all of a sudden we actually have to use a different tool, namely a skewer. Very nice, wasn't it? Let's go for the next one. Now here it will, it will be a cooperation between the bishop and the knight, not no rook this time. So now the king is in a delicate position, the black king. It's almost getting checkmated. If you could imagine the white bishop uh, going on c6 or d7, it would be checkmate already. However, it's not so simple to get there because uh, the, white, the, the, the black king could start running back to b5. But white has a forceful way of either forking the black king and queen, or ending up checkmating black's king. So the first move is bishop e4. Well, if black captures, simple, here we go. But what happens if the queen goes, let's say, to g8? Look how far the black king and queen are. It's impossible to fork with such a distance in between the two pieces. But you don't have to wait for long until the black king will end up on c6. Look at that. b3, the king has only one move. Yet another check. Again, only one move. And here we go. But what happens if black doesn't even bother moving the queen and plays g6? Then there is a different problem. The white bishop will move to d3, threatening the checkmate, which basically is un almost unstoppable, except with queen b7, when the bishop goes to c4, now the black king cannot run away, and black cannot stop the upcoming b3, which even if it will not be a checkmate, but black will be forced to give up the queen. But we're not done yet. What if the queen goes to h6? Well then, the story is a little similar, at least for a little bit. Bishop d3, making sure the black king cannot run away on b5, and again threatening with the same checkmate as before, with the pawn b2 to b3. But black has a defensive resource for now. Queen d2, look at that. It pins the pawn, right? The pawn cannot move because it's pinned. How to make progress now? If you missed this defensive resource for black, I suggest you stop again to try to figure out how to solve now this challenge, how to still either checkmate or win black's queen. And white has a quiet but very powerful move. That is bishop to e2. Look at that. Look, looks like a pretty harmless move, but it's not. The amazing part is that black, all of a sudden, is basically in a zugzwang. As you know, zugzwang means black wishes he wouldn't need to move, he could pass, but he cannot. Well, first things first, if queen takes bishop, fork. That's simple, right? So the point is that the black queen needs to remain on the second rank to keep pinning that pawn on b2. If the queen would move away from the second rank, white would just checkmate with b3. But black can do that by playing queen c2, still maintaining the pin. But here the problem is a different pin. Bishop to d1 forcing the queen into a fork. And here we go. But you may wonder in this position, what happens if black just makes some pawn move and doesn't allow the pin with bishop d1? Well, the pretty part now is that white still has some wading moves, like f3. But black has one too. And the problem is that it is black who is running out of wading moves first. Now, 
If the queen moves, the problems remain the same, as we discussed before making any pawn moves. And if g5, which is actually the trickiest move for black, white needs to pay attention to the detail here. Have to be cautious till the very end. It would be a huge mistake ruining a winning position taking with the f-pawn. Why? Because black all of a sudden can force stalemate. Okay, always need to be careful. Doesn't matter how won your game seems to be. Therefore, white needs to capture with the other pawn. And now it becomes a race between the past pawns. Fortunately for white, arrives first. Black arrives second. Even though black has two queens, it doesn't matter because white checkmates right away. What a jewel, wasn't this? Let's move on to our next example, yet another endgame study by the famous composer Kubel. And here there are two knights. Let's see how we're forcing black into a fork. Again, it seems that the black king and queen are just as far from each other as it gets. And obviously with such distance, no knight can fork. But here comes the chase of the queen g4 the queen has many places to go if queen takes knight fork from c4 if queen goes to e8 we need to give a well placed check the king has only one place fork from d6 if the queen goes to g5 then knight df3 and if the queen goes to d8 now then knight c6. Of course, the queen can also go to f6, which would be the same if in the main line what we'll see. So, after g4, queen h4, knight df3, and now queen f6 is the main move. Naturally, these moves lose right away. So, queen f6. And now what? If we keep attacking the queen, for example, with knight d7, queen b2 check, and white will just lose the game, period. And very impressive, quiet move is to follow now. And that is knight d4. It's pretty impressive that uh, there are so few pieces on the board, and yet the two knights are stronger than the queen. The problem is black's king on a5, and white now threatens to checkmate. For example, if queen f8, knight c4 would end the game. If the queen takes the knight, then fork. And basically, if king b6, then the fork comes with the other knight. What an amazing dance of the knights. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.